This is the Coford Books AuthorCast. I mean, I had a, a colleague stop by my office this morning and uh, he had a copy of my book had just arrived or something. And he, he came and he said, the first two words of the book are, admit it. <laughs> right. <laughs> he said, that's exactly what I want the book on Isaiah to say, right? Like, talk to me, like, uh, recognize that I'm a human being who doesn't have time to acquire uh, a, a massive scholarly uh, familiarity with, with this, but just talk to me like a human being. Tonight we're going to have a conversation with Joseph Spencer about his latest book, The Vision of All, 25 Lectures on Isaiah in Nephi's Record. Now this is part of the Contemporary Studies in Scripture series, so we'll talk a little bit about the book, we'll talk about the series, and uh, some of the uh, methodology and tools that Joseph used for this particular volume. Joseph, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Good to have you. Now we had you on not that uh, all that long ago. No, yeah, just quite recently. Yeah, for your uh, last book, For Zion, which I was a little bit late in getting an interview with you uh, on, but uh, that book has been very well received, and a lot of people really enjoyed it. Uh, now, this is a whole different subject matter that you're going yeah. through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I guess the first question is, what were you thinking? I mean, Isaiah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, in some way, most of the work I've done over the past five or six years is circled around Isaiah in one form or another. My first book uh, focuses on interpretation of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon in certain ways. Uh, and even in For Zion, there's, a, uh, there's an emphasis on ways that Paul uses Isaiah, the way that the Doctrine and Covenants engages with Isaiah. Uh, so I've been, in some ways, uh, circling around this for a while, and this sort of represents my attempt at finally narrowing in and, uh, and trying to nail down some of the, the details. Why do you think Isaiah presents such a challenge to readers? Uh, I think there are a few uh, reasons, a few obvious reasons. One is just that uh, King James translation, uh, which is what the Book of Mormon largely adopts with Isaiah, uh, is 400 years old now. And uh, so it, it's sometimes awkward. It's sometimes uh, dated. It's sometimes overly poetic or overly flowery. Uh, and that alone can make uh, Isaiah a bit daunting. But combine that with the fact that it's uh, coming out of a what for us is a very foreign context, um, right? Centuries before the time of Jesus, uh, and it's and it's not uh, it's not a, a text that uh, that we as Latter Day Saints tend to read often enough to feel familiar with or uh, to have riddled through some of the the historical. Uh, background that one needs to make sense of it. So I think there are a few, a few things that just hurdles, I guess you could say, that we we haven't collectively jumped over in a way that makes it accessible. Now you're not taking on the entire scope of Isaiah uh, or Isaiah writings uh, in this book. You're narrowing it down a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about your focus? Sure. Um, in this book, I'm looking just at the role that Isaiah plays in Nephi's record. And of course, Nephi uh, quotes a lot of Isaiah, but uh, not even uh, not even a third of the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters in Isaiah. But Nephi quotes uh, what around 20 uh, around 20 chapters. Uh, so yeah, I only look at the chapters of Isaiah that Nephi deals with, and I spend a lot of the book not uh, looking directly at the text of Isaiah, but at how Nephi adapts him and uses him and structures his record around him. Uh, so my main purpose here is not to get to Isaiah himself so much as how Nephi is using him, what the Book of Mormon as a result is doing with Isaiah. Now, I think that's interesting, particularly for a Latter-day Saint audience. Now, you're able to get 300 pages of material out of just yeah. Nephi's uh, quotes of Isaiah. That's pretty remarkable. Yes. Imagine doing all of Isaiah, right? <laughs> right. All his writings, multi-volume, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's worth saying most uh, most contemporary commentaries on Isaiah run to two or three large volumes. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're you're looking at Isaiah through the um, lens of Nephi. Is that fair to mm -hmm. say? Yeah, so, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about how that approach kind of differentiates your work in the field. Uh, yeah, that's good. So if you look around at most Mormon. Uh, books on Isaiah, they tend to try to introduce Isaiah as a whole. Uh, and so we'll get a lot of information about Isaiah's own times, uh, what were things like in the 8th century before Christ in Judah, 
uh, or we'll get some of the debate among scholars about authorship and uh, all of these kinds of things. And then we'll get into, you know, historical particularities, what this or that chapter means, and so on. Uh, sometimes through an LDS lens, often not. But uh, what I'm trying to do in this book is just say, why is Nephi interested in Isaiah? I mean, why so many chapters of Isaiah woven into Nephi's record? Is there something that interests him here? Is he just bored of writing sometimes and wants to copy <laughs> stuff down to fill space? Like, what is it that drives him? And I think there are really clear and um, and really informative answers to those questions. Give no, us go ahead. a hint. Yeah, I think uh, I think we can say a couple of really definite things in a general vein uh, about what interests Nephi. Uh, one of the things you find in Isaiah's writings uh, is uh, what has been called a kind of shift in Hebrew prophecy. So before Isaiah's time, uh, Hebrew prophets tended to sort of speak in the moment about concerns uh, that were uh, vital to what was going on right then. Think of Elijah or something like this. Uh, he's sent out. He goes to prophesy. He goes and speaks to the king, and there are these kind of wild experiences and so on. Uh, but he doesn't have any reason to write anything down. He's not looking at a later period uh, or anything like that. Um, what you have beginning with Isaiah is a form of prophecy that is concerned with the future in some sense. He, uh, from very early in his prophetic career, uh, encounters heavy opposition to his preaching. Uh, he even writes about this directly in the book. Uh, and it turns him from the task of a kind of oral prophecy given in very immediate circumstances to a written prophecy that's oriented to a future people that might actually listen, might actually care about what he's talking about. And at least uh, twice in the course of the book of Isaiah, uh, he describes this turn toward the future and this task of writing as a, a form of prophecy that must be written and sealed up for a later generation. And I think Nephi reads Isaiah and says, that's what I've seen in my own visions. My people uh, are going to reject this message and our writings will have been written up, sealed, and then wait for another time when people will be ready to read them. So I think Nephi sees that and says, ah, there's a clear echo of my own interests here. The other major theme uh, in Isaiah that I think interests Nephi is so Isaiah, especially in the latter portions of the book of Isaiah, what scholars tend to call second Isaiah, there's a heavy emphasis on a major portion of Israel being hauled off into exile in Babylon uh, and then coming back thanks to the assistance of non Israelites, uh, in this case, Persians, uh, during the sixth century, who are going to restore Judahites uh, to, to their lands and help them build the temple. And this kind of thing. And I think Nephi sees in this uh, an echo of something else he's seen in vision. He reports having seen in vision that uh, the descendants of his father, the Latter-day Lamanites, will be, uh, will be restored to their inheritance thanks to non-Israelites who have settled in the New World, what the Book of Mormon calls Gentiles. And so I think here Nephi sees something else in Isaiah that's very similar to what he's seen in his own prophetic experiences, uh, a reflection on Israel being restored to its lands and its inheritance thanks to the assistance of non-Israelites. And Nephi says, oh, I can use Isaiah to make sense of what I've seen. Now, you brought up something, uh, the second Isaiah, and that's probably another area that differentiates your work here, maybe from some other Latter-day Saint scholars uh, that have dealt with the topic of Isaiah and haven't really addressed uh, whether there was multiple Isaiah writers or whether this is all the same the same person. Uh, one of the assertions that you made in the book, and I think it's it was very wonderfully done, very wonderfully crafted, was that the Book of Mormon itself may even support uh, later authorship additions to the Book of Isaiah. Can you get into a little bit of this? Yeah, um, I always want to be careful on this terrain because I'm not a Hebrew Bible specialist, right? Uh, I'm a philosophical reader of Scripture. Uh, so I always want to be careful because I don't have the really solid expertise to draw strong conclusions. Uh, but I think it's really important for especially academic readers of the Book of Mormon to take seriously the work that's been done on Isaiah authorship uh, and questions of how the Book of Isaiah took shape uh, over what may have been centuries. Uh, and what uh, strikes me as a reader of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon is that, um, well, I guess two things here. One is that the Book of Mormon uh, clearly draws on texts that most scholars 
think, uh, predate Book of Mormon times by a long shot, but draws also on texts that most Isaiah scholars today would say, these shouldn't be in the Book of Mormon. They shouldn't have been written until uh, at least 50, 60 years after Nephi's family would have left with the brass plates from Jerusalem. Uh, So the Book of Mormon here seems in a certain sense to be at odds with contemporary biblical scholarship. And some people have used this to attack historicity uh, of the Book of Mormon. But what's also interesting, this is the other half of this, uh, is that the Book of Mormon never quotes from what scholars call Third Isaiah. The last 11 chapters of the Book of Isaiah uh, seem to have been written even later, right? Probably in what we call the post-exilic era. So sometime after 530 BC, so long after Nephi's family has left. And uh, the Book of Mormon never once quotes uh, in any definitive way from 3rd Isaiah uh, and other things that may be related to 3rd Isaiah. It doesn't quote from. And this is suggestive, I think, in a really important way that the Book of Mormon wants to say we should take that scholarship seriously because the Book of Mormon is itself giving us some evidence that 3rd Isaiah was not available to the Nephites. It wasn't on the brass plates. So the Book of Mormon ends up being kind of complicated to summarize all of that, right? It seems on the one hand to call into question some of the conclusions that Isaiah scholars have drawn, but it also seems to support others in a way that suggests we ought to take this scholarship seriously and uh, and see what we can learn from it and maybe what we can contribute to it. And you also brought up that there were things uh, in third Isaiah that would have been a natural fit uh, had yeah, the, Joseph been including the, these. Exactly. The most obvious one is, so one of the passages of Isaiah that the, that Nephi is particularly interested in is this passage in Isaiah 49 about uh, Gentile kings and queens who become nursing fathers and nursing mothers to Israel and carry them home on their shoulders. Uh, and in part of third Isaiah, we get a massive exposition, almost a chapter long commentary of sorts on that passage. Uh, And it would seem if Nephi had access to that, to third Isaiah, he would be quoting that left and right in a way of, uh, as a way of trying to clarify and expand on this passage that he's so interested in. The fact that it doesn't show up is really suggestive. Another thing that you brought up too, is that uh, some of the scholarship over the past several decades has shifted. Perhaps um, the historical criticism focus, um, had uh, while it's still strong, it seems like right now there is a real strong emphasis on a literary uh, criticism focus. Can you, yeah. can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. So um, historical critical scholarship, where the task is to uh, identify under what circumstances the original or the earliest part of the text may have been written, and can we establish uh, the original author's identity and all of that kind of thing. That was. Uh, in a lot of ways, the dominant form of intellectual work on Isaiah or really most of the Bible for almost 200 years, I mean, from the mid uh, mid to late 18th century until quite recently. And it does, as you mentioned, continue. Uh, it's still a major part of biblical studies. But over the last 50, 40, 50 years, there's emerged greater and greater interest in, and at this point may even be dominant – Uh, There's emerged more interest in literary readings, the idea being, can we look at um, literary structures, literary patterns in Isaiah or in biblical texts more generally, and how they suggest a kind of artfulness of final form, if I can put it that way. The idea being that um, uh, even if it's the work of editors and redactors and not of, say, Isaiah himself or something – uh, there's nonetheless in the final form of the text, as we have it in the canon, uh, there's uh, there's clearly a set of theological presuppositions and interests that are guiding the way that that uh, that the prophecies take final shape, and that's what primarily drives um, most people working on Isaiah today. Not just saying can we like isolate a kernel of definitely. Uh, Isaianic material that we know goes back to the 8th century, but can we look at how this takes shape and how the final shape um, suggests a kind of theological program, almost a kind of set of interests and concerns that have, that are driving the way this thing is uh, formed in the end? 
We're talking with Joseph M. Spencer, author of The Vision of All 25 Lectures on Isaiah and Nephi's Record, the latest volume in the Contemporary Studies in Scripture series, and we'll be back after this break. Coming soon from Greg Coford Books, The Garden of Enid, Adventures of a Weird Mormon Girl, Part 1 by Scott Hales. Fifteen-year-old Enid Gardner is a self-proclaimed weird Mormon girl. When she isn't chatting with Joseph Smith or the Book of Abraham Mummy, she's searching for herself between the spaces of doubt and belief. Along the way, she must grapple with her Mormon faith as it adapts to the 21st century. She must also confront the painful mysteries at the heart of her strained relationship with her ailing mother. This edition of The Garden of Enid, Adventures of a Weird Mormon Girl, recasts the award-winning webcomic as a two-part graphic novel. With revised and previously unpublished comics, it features the familiar story that captivated thousands online, yet offers new glimpses into Enid's year-long odyssey. The Garden of Enid Part 1 will be available on November 15th. Pre-order your copy today at gregcofer.com. And we're back with Joseph M. Spencer, author of The Vision of All, 25 Lectures on Isaiah and Nephi's Record. Let's talk a little bit about the methodology that you used in laying out Isaiah, because I think that's really the uh, probably the most unique aspect. If I, I mean, there's a lot of unique aspects about this book, right? But if I could summarize... Uh, what sets this book apart from many other scholarly texts is the fact that you're doing this as a first-person lecture narrative speaking directly to the reader. It's really a candid conversation between student and teacher, between you and and your readership. Can you talk a little bit about your decisions uh, to go that direction with this? Yeah. Uh, so to some extent, this grew out of the, the – well – let me back up a step here. The, so as I've given more and more public presentations, even at scholarly venues and this kind of a thing, uh, I've begun trying to write my presentations in a more conversational tone and then afterwards writing the scholarly print version, if you will, uh, for publication. And I've uh, really enjoyed writing in that style, and it made me start to think about the possibility of uh, writing work that would just be published in that form rather than just delivered in that form. Uh, combine that with the fact that over the last uh, couple of years, I've been teaching Book of Mormon courses uh, at BYU and have worked through these Isaiah passages out loud with my students uh, and found ways of communicating with them about it in a, in a way that's not as threatening or as, uh, as frightening to them. And I, I found some success in that, and I thought – uh, this might be a really useful way of writing a book on Isaiah rather than uh, assuming a kind of scholarly tone and a kind of detached voice uh, and working through the issues um, in a kind of systematic way. Uh, just being able to say, I've got this many words before I would run out of time. And so what can I say about such and such a subject on Isaiah in a kind of chatty classroom voice uh, in that many words? Uh, and then just pile up 25 lectures like that, and whatever I can fit in is worth saying. Um, so that was the idea. That's what motivated it. And um, and I frankly, I really like <laughs> the result. I, I'm really happy with uh, with what I hope others see as uh, really down to earth attempt to talk about Isaiah. We don't have to have a million footnotes and uh, a ton of uh, scholarly apparatus and so on, but instead we can just kind of talk our way through uh, what's going on in Isaiah here. Well, the early reviews that have come in have, have certainly shown that your uh, methodology is is working. It's um, it's transferring what you want over. Um, people are are coming back saying that this is the most readable book that they've ever picked up on Isaiah. So congratulations on that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and I, I mean, yeah, again, I mean, it's not an, it's not an easy topic to, to tackle and, and you, but you do this in a way that doesn't uh, minimize or, or simplify Isaiah. In fact, you state that as, as part of your goal right up front is that you're, you're not doing this to try to make Isaiah more simple for people. Right. Yeah. I think that's really important. There's a lot of work out there. Um, published by Latter-day Saints especially, that tries to bring Isaiah down to earth, but still writes in a kind of detached tone and that sort of a thing. And so the way it tries to make Isaiah accessible is by 
cutting out a lot of the complexity and just saying, oh, here's the idea for these six verses. Here's kind of a little bit of background here. Uh, but uh, for the most part, let's just make this as simple as possible. Here, I'm trying to leave Isaiah and Nephi's project as complex and rich as possible, because I think it is really complex and rich. But by changing the tone uh, of the presentation, I hope it's easier to get into the complexity uh, without feeling like uh, it's alienating over uh, like over uh, abundance of information. Uh, instead, uh, we can sort of take it step by step and work together. And I, I'm hoping that works. Yeah. So to kind of summarize my feelings on it, it's uh, it seems like a lot of scholars try to take uh, a a low Isaiah approach, for lack of better terminology, <laughs> but use a high academic you know, uh, method, right. And you're reversing this. You're, you're taking a high Isaiah approach and using a lower academic method, uh, intentionally lower academic method. I mean, this this isn't to discredit the work at all because it is, uh, it, it, but it has that feeling of sitting in a classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think this may be necessary, right. Uh, I mean, I had a, a colleague stop by my office this morning and uh, had a copy of my book had just arrived or something. And he, he came and he said, the first two words of the book are admit it. Right. <laughs> he said, that's exactly what I want the book on Isaiah to say, right? Like <laughs> talk to me, like, uh, recognize that I'm a human being who doesn't have time to acquire, uh, a, a massive scholarly, uh, familiarity with, with this, but just talk to me like a human being. So, right. Well, I do think it's a it's a very successful approach. Can you give us just a few highlights that really stood out to you from your lectures that you can share with the audience? Boy, that's a good question. So my favorite things uh, in writing the project, boy, um, I guess I'd highlight two. Uh, one, I really enjoyed the discoveries I made in Isaiah 48, as quoted in First Nephi 20. Uh, in my previous work on Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, I'd not touched that chapter more or less at all, and uh, and it's I'm working on another book on Isaiah that's a much more scholarly book. Um, and in that project, I'm not working on Isaiah 48 at all, but working on that as a kind of example because it's the first full chapter of Isaiah that gets quoted in the Nephi's record. Working on that chapter as a kind of example to highlight all of these aspects of Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, I was just blown away at how much depth and richness there is to that one chapter alone. And what really struck me is that uh, as I'm coming to the end of all the work I did on it in writing the book, uh, I realized with some shock that it's uh, it's not ever quoted again. Nephi quotes the full chapter, but he never alludes back to it, doesn't ever borrow the language from it again. So it's just this sort of like, all this interesting stuff going on there and the book of mormon just sort of drops it on you and then moves on and doesn't get obsessed with all the interesting work there just leaves you to work on it that i thought uh, was really interesting i could spend i think i spend four or five lectures working through the implications of that one chapter mm. uh, and there's that much there but the book of mormon never makes a big deal of it I, that i found really striking uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, it became clear and clear as I worked on this project. I hadn't seen this with as much clarity before, uh, but as I worked on this, uh, there began to emerge for me three passages that Nephi uh, is most obsessed with. One from uh, Isaiah 11, one from Isaiah 29, and one from Isaiah 49. And it's uh, striking to me that Nephi comes back to those three passages again and again and again, and they seem to organize all of his interest uh, in Isaiah. And that, I think, is really uh, striking. Once we can say, oh, there are a couple of passages in particular that get him excited, then it's possible for us to go, okay, so now what can we say about his interpretive program? It's not haphazard. It's not him quoting large chunks of Isaiah because – uh, there's probably something worthwhile in here. There's a program, and he's doing something uh, deliberate, and it's worth uh, isolating those passages and seeing what he's doing. Now, I don't know if this is going to be off topic or if this is in line with uh, with what you're discussing now, but it certainly ties into something that you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation uh, when you mentioned that that you'd gotten into doing some Isaiah work even at the time that you were writing for Zion, which. Mm-hmm. Which of course has um, you know larger implications into uh, kind of the order of 
how we should be living as a religious society, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and you're you're commenting that Paul's use of Isaiah was really where that tied in. Now, one of the things that you had uh, mentioned, this ties in both of the works for Zion and the vision of all. Um, you mentioned that Isaiah, Nephi's use of Isaiah in particular, really helps us to understand the restoration. Yeah. Can you can you broaden that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I mean, for one, it's clear that Nephi sees in Isaiah um, mirror images of the things he's seen in vision. And what he's seen in vision is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, what we would call the restoration. Uh, and so he sees in Isaiah's images of a sealed book, uh, a nice anticipation of what happens in the restoration. Uh, even more relevant to For Zion, when he sees uh, in Isaiah uh, an image of what he's seen as Gentiles in the new world assisting in the redemption of Israel, the Lamanites, uh, there we see the picture that the Doctrine and Covenants is uh, obsessed with. And in Isaiah, or in Doctrine and Covenants section 42, the Law of Consecration, which is a major focus in my book For Zion, uh, in section 42, uh, the Lord refers to uh, the the prophecies of the holy prophets being fulfilled through the building up of Zion. And in context, it's very, very clear that what he's referring to is these very prophecies from Isaiah that Nephi is interested in. So I think there's actually very close continuity between what the Doctrine and Covenants understands as the building up of Zion and the law of consecration and what Nephi understands as uh, the – the, the Isaianic image of, of the restoration. We've been admonished over and over again uh, in scripture through, uh, through prophets to take Isaiah seriously. Um, and you mentioned in the book that, that there's a couple of approaches that people end up with uh, when they do try to take Isaiah seriously. Either they end up guilty because they can't understand him or they end up perhaps a little overconfident and uh, maybe patting themselves on the back a little bit too much as to how much effort and time they've spent um, figuring out and dissecting Isaiah. Um, first of all, how do you think that your book addresses those two kind of binaries? And secondly, why do we need to take Isaiah seriously, in your opinion? Yeah, good. Um, I, I hope I've tried to split the difference there. I mean, I, my worry about us being so freaked out by Isaiah or so bored with Isaiah or whatever it is, uh, just being nervous as soon as we hear Isaiah's name come up, uh, there I just think uh, there's just a little bit of work necessary to get us over that hump. Isaiah is not, not even half so difficult as we think he is. And so part of this is just bringing him down to earth uh, and then recognizing what he's really up to, then we have a lot of work to do. Uh, but also, I've tried to steer away from the other extreme. My worry there, I mean, here I'll be a bit more blunt than I am in the book. My worry about uh, a lot of what I hear when people are very excited about Isaiah and feel like they've done a lot to understand him is that a lot of the interpretation I hear there gets kind of crackpotty at best. And, uh, and starts to be sort of wild, mystical interpretation of Isaiah when, again, I think Isaiah is actually pretty down to earth. It's relatively straightforward. So I think if if I've done anything here that, uh, that steers clear of those two extremes, it's by just recognizing that Isaiah is not so wild. He's not so out there. Uh, it's difficult, and there's work to do, and we've got to be careful in interpreting him, but it's not... Uh, both both extremes end up making Isaiah far more complicated uh, than he is, um, and then as a result, miss the real depth and richness and complexity uh, that's there in Isaiah. We can't make any sense of the Book of Mormon, ultimately, if we don't take Isaiah seriously. Uh, one of the things I try to do uh, in the book, I try very hard to do in the book, is to show that every chapter of Nephi's record is built on his attempt to communicate to us about Isaiah. Uh, we often think, well, they're the Isaiah chapters, but the rest of Nephi is a nice breather <laughs> right away from Isaiah. But I think he's he's doing exactly the opposite. He wants us to see everything here is built around Isaiah. And if that's the case, uh, if we don't take Isaiah seriously, we can't even understand the first part of the Book of Mormon, let alone the rest of it. But the, the other reason I'd say we should study Isaiah is that um, – 
Isaiah is the prophet who is most interested in the in the Abrahamic covenant, in the history of Israel, in the possibility of the redemption of the world. I think he's clearer and uh, and deeper about those kinds of things, and we need those really badly today. So this is part of the Contemporary Studies in Scripture uh, series, and for those listeners who aren't familiar with this series, it's uh, a series from Greg Coford Books that features authors whose work engage in rigorous textual analysis of the Bible and other LDS scriptures written by Latter-day Saints for a Latter-day Saint audience. And these books utilize the tools of historical criticism, literature, philosophy, and the sciences to elaborate the richness and complexity found in the standard works series provides readers with new and fascinating ways to read, study, and reread these sacred texts. This is an excellent addition to the Contemporary Studies in Scripture series. I think all the books in the Contemporary Studies in Scripture series are fantastic. What do you think, Joseph? Yeah, I think it's a really important series. We um, Way too much LDS publishing uh, in the last 10 or 15 years has been on history, history, and more history. Right. And it's re- really nice to see a whole book series dedicated solely to Scripture. Well, it was great having you, Joseph, and we'll see you later on. Okay. Thank you for listening to the Coford Books AuthorCast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our show. And also follow us on Facebook for the latest news about our authors, releases, events, and promotions.